Joining me now is Dr. Francis Yamazaki, a 30-year veteran of the field of anesthesiology and, dare I say, sports medicine in that context? Yeah, you could say that. Tell us a little bit about your background uh, to fill us in. Um, I'm from L.A. I went to USC all the way through and um, was a cardiac anesthesiologist for the first 10 years of my career. And then for the past 20 years, I've been with the Kern and Job Orthopedic Group, a pretty well, world-renowned sports program. I want to talk about treating the world-class athlete and how that may drive you to use superior technology or, or to advance your practice in ways that might be different from the rank-and-file clinician. Well, you're right. You know, we treat every patient the best we can equally, some more equal. And in the sports world, especially high-profile athletes that we have, uh, it's scrutinized by everybody, not just the medical world, but by the media, by the agents and everybody else. Um, for that reason, perfection is demanded. And for that reason, this group of surgeons are at the cutting edge and they're expected to know and be able to show the differences of new quantum leap changes. And we as anesthesiologists need to keep up, if not stay ahead of them. You talk a little bit about pushing yourself, how athletes push themselves, how you challenge medical students to push themselves, to be better at what they do. It seems like there's a similar almost term or, or feeling about that. Help me understand that. Well, I'm not that driven. Um, but I think one of the things that occurs for most of us in medicine, we start out with so much enthusiasm. We're in the R&D sector of medicine in terms of academics. And when we come out in private practice, you don't want to lose that. You want to establish yourself with the conventional, traditional standards, but you still want to keep alive the new things you were learning. And you wait for those things to develop so you can use them. When you're at a center as mine, which is a cutting edge sports medicine group, you get to use those things quickly and easily because they're embraced. So it's only been seven years since the smartphone has been around. Look how fast things have changed. Your 30 year perspective in, in anesthesiology um, must have given you the opportunity to experience a lot of changes. I give a talk about the progression of anesthesia especially, specifically, the nerve blocks. But I do cite the smartphone. Because the technology that was given to us for smartphones was, made us all feel awkward. And yet, we all became incredibly enhanced by it. Same thing with medicine. I started out with a blood pressure cuff, an EKG, and a stethoscope. And when I started my career, everything exploded because of technology. Safety increased, and extent of care increased. And uh, so technology is naturally a big part of what I've done in medicine. Do you think that the emergence of visual medicine and let's say things like bedside ultrasound share an intellectual or even an emotional border with the smartphone? Is the smartphone a lever for adoption of things like bedside ultrasound? Definitely, definitely. I, the parallel is unbelievable. Um, again, there is a learning curve that makes people awkward but they know deep down inside it's going to make them better. And it's the challenge of making the environment for people to learn and adopt the use of this so they're proficient. And uh, the smartphone is the greatest parallel that I think everybody in visual medicine will be able to use to, um, I'd have to say, spread the world. Hmm. Interesting. So there seems to be different kinds of adopters, though. And that may be a function of practice. It might be a function of age. It might just be a function of, of human nature. Perhaps you can discuss that a little bit. Is that, is that a, a point of frustration for you as an innovator? Um, it's not frustrating. I realize what the actual environment is. I, I think I explained it once. Uh, the, there's certain groups, and it's the young group that comes out that's so armed and excited with technology that they're raised with that perspective. They're ready, and they want to take in everything they can when it's available. So that's not a group you have to work with. The second group is a group that's been established, been out maybe 10 years, it's created a, a reputation and very, very successful. Trying something new may jeopardize their success and actually make them vulnerable to not being perfect like they have been. So that's a hard nut to crack. Uh, but generally, the literature supports it. People start understanding that success, they will start going towards that. 
uh, new technology. And then there's the other group, which is my group. These are the old people. We're established, we have a record, and we're very proficient. And quite frankly, we don't see the benefit because we're already good. And I think that group is a group that needs to have the champion doctor that explains and shows them how much better life can be, safer for both the patients and the surgeons. And that's a big thing to be able to have. And I think those three things will be achieved. So let's try to build a visual metaphor towards what's going on in technology and clinical practice. Are we at a tipping point? Are we at an uphill battle? Are we on a downward slope? Where are we in terms of the implementation of things like bedside ultrasound to guide procedures and diagnosis? No, it's, nothing's going to rush this. Just like the smartphone, it was there, but nothing rushes it. You know, it's like every other stage in medicine in my 30 years, every, every bit of uh, knowledge opens a window of understanding that changes everybody. And ultrasound, visual medicine at the bedside, in the emergency room, in anesthesia, will become a standard. It's time has to wait for everybody else to catch up. But it won't be long. Are there any other parallels where the practice of medicine was changed? Was it the, the finger, pulse oximetry, something that, that had that similar bigness? Because it seems from your discussion that this is gonna be a very, very important clinical evolution. That pretty much is it, you hit it. The pulse oximetry. Again, when I started, I had very little technology unless it was invasive. Uh, the pulse oximetry was incredible, and I think it has a very similar parallel. The amount of information that you gain from ultrasound will be very similar to, similar to what we have with pulse oximetry. Uh, it is the visual anatomy of the real time, and it gives you a clinical evaluation assessment of what's happening. And uh, we've not had something like this since pulse oximetry. So what are some of the other touch points of innovation? in the evolution of anesthesiology over 30 years? When you give your talk, are there some slides that people go, ah, that's it, kind of thing? Well, it's a very similar, it's a slide I used with the Neanderthal creating a walking position and then holding a smartphone. So the Neanderthal moves all the way up the progression. I'll give you that slide. The, the reality is that the quantum leaps in medicine in terms of anesthesia and surgery are paralleled, and it's due to monitoring technology of pharmacology and the technology of diagnostic with the CAT scans, MRIs, and then ultrasound. Everything came with technology, quite frankly. Uh, anesthesia was pretty unsafe, and because of the safety factors that were created with new pharmacology and drugs and monitoring, it enabled more surgeries to be performed that couldn't be performed safely in a more routine manner. Interesting. And that was the quantum leap. But then the technology brought even more monitoring, more diagnostic techniques that made us get to another level of surgery, the endoscopic, laparoscopic, arthroscopic. And now we could do things where people could go home. Again, you need to have the parallel of managing pain so people could go home. So you did these new surgeries and they went home. It's another quantum leap. That's, that's, that's fascinating. So pharmacology played an important role Yet yeah, that was sort of analytical science based. It came in a test tube. I want you to comment on the evolution of medicine into the context of visual medicine. That when we, when we see ventricular tachycardia on a monitor, or when we look at, at a line being placed, how is that visual assimilation changing the very practice of medicine and perhaps even making it safer or even better? As I said, I started 30 years ago. To be able to do cardiac anesthesia and have only a catheter to try to measure maybe a pressure and understand what was going on compared to that now, my best instrument was looking over the screen and looking at the heart directly. What happened was the ultrasound came in with the transesophageal echocardiogram. We could see the wall motion, very rough, but eventually it was perfected. When you have that now for putting in intravenous lines, to be putting in catheters in the right position, and to be able to assess the wall motion, the chest motion. Um, as I said, it's another sense that not only allows us to understand it, but to learn more. And quite frankly, it's like looking at fish from the boat and then snorkeling. It's a totally different appreciation of what you're doing and where you're doing it. And that's, again, I expect it to be explosion of quantum leap knowledge. That's a great, a great analogy. Let's talk about those fish a little bit. Um, 
how does this translate to the patient? Are you seeing patients responding to visual medicine, some of the new technological advances? Do they see it as an as a innovation? Oh, certainly, certainly. The reinforcement for patients to understand what we're doing or what we're trying to do, understand their disease, understand the treatment, and to be able to see it visually, uh, it's, it's another, quote, quantum leap for understanding and having relationship bonding between your patient and your physician. That's uh, very valuable and not something we can get very easily, the trust. Thank you very much for taking the time and chatting with us and letting us take a look into the future of medicine. Thank you. You're welcome.